How's your health? Man, that's taken on a new meaning in the last few months, hasn't it? How's your health? Health has been top of mind for all of us. We've been asking each other, you good? You okay? Your family good? Everybody staying healthy? It's been the lead story on the news for months and months. Everyone's concerned about health, and rightly so. You know, before I started working in full-time ministry, I was practicing pharmacy. I guess I just like jobs where I get to stand up on a little platform. And in pharmacy, people were always coming in, talking to me about their health. And here's what I've noticed. The basics of being healthy are what? Diet and exercise. We all know that, diet and exercise. But those things are hard. We don't want that. We want the latest fad diet. We want the quick shortcut. We want the new supplement. We want the new pill. We want to eat what we want and lose weight while we sleep, right? I remember when I was practicing pharmacy, I had a guy come in the store one time. Man, he had lost a lot of weight. I was like, bro, you're looking good. How'd you lose all the weight? He said, man, I got on this Atkins thing. I cut the carbs, weight fell off. I was like, man, good for you. A couple months went by, I saw his wife in the store. I said, man, I saw Bill a little while ago. He's looking good, lost a lot of weight. She said, you hadn't seen him lately. He ate one biscuit and it all came back. <laughs> kind of how it works, isn't it? Well, now I'm in a similar job. And I talk to people every day about their health. But I'm talking to them about their spiritual health. And as the passage was read for us earlier, and what had to just be music to God's ears to hear that read in this place, in that language, I hope you read along on the English side and you saw that Paul is writing to Timothy about spiritual health, how we can be spiritually healthy as we minister and serve and follow Jesus. So go ahead and turn there with me. If you would, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you've got your Bible, your digital device, maybe you brought your study guide, 1 Timothy 4, we're going to pick it up in verse 6 as we continue to work through this book that we've been in this fall. Well, my name's Michael. I serve on the community team here. I'm glad you're here. Glad to have those of you joining us on the live stream as well. And before we start looking more closely at this passage, I just want to remind you how this, this kind of fits in to this letter, 1 Timothy. It is, of course, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to his young protege, Timothy. Timothy was a, a church planter and a pastor, and, and Paul told them at the beginning of the letter, stay there in Ephesus. Ephesus, the big city, an important city, but also a center of pagan worship, a home to a temple, the largest building in the world dedicated to Artemis. So a hard place to plant a church, a hard place to pastor a church. And what we've seen throughout the letter is Paul's telling Timothy, bring some order to the church and root out the false teachers. And so last week, as Garland walked us through the first part of 1 Timothy 4, we saw some things about these false teachers. They're teaching sort of this asceticism. Don't get married. Abstain from certain foods. They've got this false separation between physical and spiritual. And so this morning, Paul begins our passage with these words. If you point out these things to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus. And so we have to ask, point out what things? Well, first of all, point out these false teachings in chapter four, verses one through five. But I think even more importantly, he's saying, point them back to Jesus. Point them back to the gospel. Back in chapter three and verse 16, I think this is what Paul wants Timothy to point out, that Jesus appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. Garland said, right here, we see that Jesus came, he was proclaimed, and he won the victory. And Paul says, if you remind them of this, Timothy, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And that word minister, it just jumps off the page at me because in the Greek, it's the word diakonos. If you were with us two weeks ago, when we were in the beginning of chapter three, we talked extensively about that word. In chapter three, the translators translated as deacon. But now in chapter four, they translate it as minister. It really means servant. And so personally, I like to read it that way through the whole book. I think Paul's being very consistent in how he's using it. So here he's addressing Timothy, but 
It applies to everyone. Everyone who wants to be a servant minister working for the name of Jesus. And what he's going to point us all to is spiritual health. I think in this passage this morning, we could say this, a servant minister, a diaconos of Messiah Jesus. Remember, Christ means Messiah. Pursue spiritual health. Those of us who want to serve and minister in the name of Jesus, Israel's Messiah and the world's true king, we're to pursue health. And Paul's going to give us three areas that we can do this in, in our training, in our lifestyle, and in our gifting. So let's begin with that first one in our training. He says in verse 6 that we need to be nourished on the truths of the faith, and in verse 7 that we need to train ourselves to be godly. You know what that sounds like to me? Diet and exercise. Eat right and exercise for your physical health and also for your spiritual health. Nourish and train. A healthy diet. Be careful about what you take in. He says what you need to take in are the truths of the faith and the good teaching you followed. See, he's playing off what these false teachers are saying. They're saying, if you want to be right before God, you got to abstain from these certain foods and these certain fleshly activities. And Paul says, no, I'll tell you what you need to do. I'll tell you what you need to consume, the truth. Consume God's word. Y'all, just like there's nothing that impacts your physical health as much as your diet, there is nothing, nothing more important to your spiritual health than a steady diet of God's word, the Bible. Now, it's not the only thing we need to do, just like eating right, it's not the only thing to be physically healthy, but it is foundational. I've seen so many people over the years that their spiritual lives have been transformed. Their journey to Christ has just been changed forever because they started to read the Bible. So I wanna urge you, make that part of your daily routine. Pick it up and read it. You'll be amazed at the difference it makes. So he says, nourish yourself on the truths of the faith. And then he says, and the good teachings that you've followed. Now in the Greek, it has this idea of something that's been going on in the past and continues to impact the present. So really what he's saying is, keep doing what you've been doing. Keep following this good teaching that you've received. And he's contrasting this with the False teachers, he's saying, don't follow false teaching. Instead, continue following good teaching. Be nourished with good teaching. Then he says, and work out. Train yourself. It's the Greek word gymnazo. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to see that's where we get gymnasium and gymnastics. And at the root of that word is discipline. Because we all know it takes discipline to go to the gym and work out your physical body. I always say in basketball season, I go to the gym twice a week. What I don't say is I sit in the seats and eat popcorn and watch other people exercise. Paul's he playing off this self-denial idea. The false teachers are saying, deny yourself. To put your body in submission. Paul says, yeah, yes, discipline yourself, but not through food or Denying yourself certain things, but instead discipline yourself, look at it, to be godly. In fact, Paul's going to go on to say physical training, yes, it's good. It's a good thing to take care of your physical body, but that's of temporary value. He says spiritual workouts, man, those are good for you now and into eternity. And then for the third time in the book, he says, this is a trustworthy saying, which I'm starting to think is Paul's way of saying, y'all know I'm right. Then he says, this is why we do all this work. This is why we labor and strive. Because we put our hope, not in these false gods, not in this idol, in this temple, not in these false teachers. No, we've put our hope in the living God, the God of the Bible. He says he's the savior of the world. That language there, Savior of the world, Garland brought this up in our Sermon Notes podcast this week as we were talking about this passage. Paul is pulling that from Roman propaganda of the time. In fact, archaeologists have discovered an inscription in Ephesus 
the city that Paul's writing to from the first century that refers to Caesar as the universal savior. Paul says, no. No, it's not Caesar who's the savior of the world. It's the living God. It's Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah and the world's true king. And he says that salvation is for the world. It's available to everyone. What he means by that is when Jesus went to that cross and shed his blood, that sacrifice was enough to cover the sins of every person who ever has lived or ever will live. There will never be a person beyond the reach of salvation in Christ. But he says, especially for those who believe. In other words, it's applied The benefits of that sacrifice are applied to those who place their faith in Jesus as their Savior, their Lord, their King. And then he says, Timothy, that's what you're to command. That's what you're to teach. Then he moves on. His next point on our spiritual health check is our lifestyle. And the first thing he says is, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. And I want to take just a quick second here just to talk to the young people who are here this morning or who are watching on the live stream. We have a lot of young people who call Fellowship Fayetteville home. And so as one of the old guys around here, I wanna say to you, welcome. Welcome, we're so glad you're here. We want the young people to feel comfortable here and to be able to engage with us and with Jesus here. I love the young people who call this church home. And on the community team where I serve, we're putting a lot of resources toward young people through our college ministry and our ministry to young adults. Why? Because we appreciate and value you young adults. So I agree with Paul. Don't let anybody tell you that God can't use you because you're young. We wanna hear from you. Speaking on behalf of the leadership of Fellowship Fayetteville, we're your biggest fans. But Paul's gonna encourage Timothy, and by extension, our young people, and really all of us, to do this in a spiritually healthy way. Because a lot of times when we feel like we're not being seen or heard, we feel like we're being marginalized, our tendency is to push back, to stand up for ourselves, to assert our rights. Remember the guy in Bud Walton who had the sign that said, stand up, old people? Then it wasn't long till there's a guy on the other side, an old guy's got a sign that says, stand up, young people. That's not a very effective way to communicate. Paul says here, here's how you do it. Be an example. And young people, let me tell you, there's nothing more encouraging and simultaneously challenging for us seasoned people than to see y'all setting the example. Oh man, when one of my kids says to me, Yeah, I'm not going to watch that. That won't be good for my thought life. Man, I think, I probably better not watch that. It won't be good for my thought life. They're setting the example. And when we hear how many of you young adults are worshiping, how many of you are in small groups, how many of you are going on mission trips, how many of you are sharing your faith, man, we're so encouraged and challenged by that. But the challenge in this passage is for you too because he's going to give us Five areas that we need to evaluate our lifestyle, our conduct. Two are external, three are internal. The first two are easily observable, speech and conduct. And I gotta be honest with y'all. For most of my life, speech has been the area that's been a struggle with me. I have probably sinned with my mouth more than any other part of me. Yeah, sometimes it's in anger or pride, but usually it's because I want to be funny. Too often in my life, when I've had the choice between godly or funny, I've gone with funny and then wished I hadn't. Y'all are all familiar. I hear people talk about this, this phenomenon that later after something's happened, you're like, oh, I wish I'd thought to say that then. Man, that would have been a good zinger. I have the opposite problem. I usually do think of it in the moment. And then later I reflect back and wish I hadn't said it. I've spent way more time regretting what I did say than what I didn't say. Speech. And it's an area for all of us 
that Paul says we need to set the example for other believers. And then conduct. How do you conduct yourself at the game or at the post-game tailgate or party? How do you conduct yourself in the office or on a business trip? I know y'all have heard this your whole life, but it's true. People really are watching. And Paul says, be someone that people would point to. Now, nobody's perfect, but that they would say, you know, he or she, they're trying to do it the right way. And then the other three are internal. Love, faith, and purity. How's my love for others? I mean, I can fake it for a while, but eventually it's gonna show whether I really love God and love people or not. And how about my faith? How's my faith? Am I making decisions? Am I living my life in a way that would say, I really do believe that what the Bible says is true. Then what about purity? How's my thought life? Am I honoring God with what I say and what I watch and what I do behind closed doors? Because all three of those, love, faith, and purity, those are heart-level things that are gonna eventually find their way into our conduct. Jesus said as much. Jesus said what comes out of our mouth originates in our heart. And so Paul isn't telling Timothy to white-knuckle it. He's not saying, hey, Timothy, just fake it till you make it, man. No, he wants us to be spiritually healthy by cultivating things at a heart level, cultivating a heart of love and faith and purity. Really, what he's calling us to do is what we just sang, to change us from the inside out, giving God our heart and letting him work on it to change our attitudes and our desires. So this isn't a message that says, try harder. He isn't saying, Timothy, fix what's wrong with yourself. No, he's saying, Timothy, you need to lean into Jesus. Look what he tells him next. He says, until we get together again, I want you to devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. When you gather the church together, in groups large or small, read God's Word, and then teach it. That's our whole model here. Every time we get together on Friday night, on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, and then throughout the week in our small groups, we open God's Word and we read it. Yes, we turn our heart to God through singing and and public prayers and readings together, through giving of our tithes and offerings. But primarily, we give the bulk of our time to reading God's word and teaching it. When Paul says preaching and teaching in the Greek, it really means exhorting and teaching doctrine. Paul wants us to open our Bible, see what's true, and then urge each other to follow Jesus. That's how we're gonna oppose false teaching, not through conflict and argument, but through opening God's word and letting that guide our worship and our lifestyle. Again, it comes down to diet and exercise. Take in God's word and then exercise that spiritual muscle of exhorting each other to follow Jesus all the more. And then the last area he's gonna address on our spiritual health checkup is our gifts. Now, there's been a lot written about spiritual gifts, and there's actually a good bit in the Bible about spiritual gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit that we don't have time to go into this morning. But I wanna give you a couple of cross-references for you note-takers, by the way. I love how we've developed this culture of taking notes at Fellowship Fayetteville. It's awesome. It's so encouraging to see how many people are making notes in their Bible or bringing their First Timothy study guide and marking the text, taking some notes. I had a lady a couple of weeks ago, she texted me a picture of her notes that she took in the teaching. It's so encouraging. So, note takers, here's what I want you to do. I want you to circle the word gift in verse 14. I want you to write these two cross-references. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10, and 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians 12, it's really the whole chapter, but we'll say 1 through 10, and then 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Those are two places where Paul and Peter unpack this idea of the charisma. That's the Greek word here for gifts. 
But for our purposes this morning, let's say this. If God calls you to do something, he will give you what you need to do it. If God puts something in front of you he wants you to do, he's going to enable you to do it. And so in Timothy's case, he says the elders, by the way, that's that word presbyteron. Paul uses it interchangeably with overseer. Back to in chapter 3, see how all this starts fitting together? The elders prayed over him, and it seems like a prophecy was made. We don't know exactly how that worked or what was said, but it seems like maybe the Holy Spirit revealed to one of those elders that Timothy was going to be able to teach. And so Paul says, Timothy, remember that gift. You have a teaching gift. Don't neglect it. Labor in your gifting. And that's something we talk about a lot around here, laboring in your gifting. And what that really means is in ministry, doing the thing that God has equipped you, has naturally given you, passion and ability to do. For example, this morning, Ryan Burton's leading worship. That dude can just pull out that guitar and play a worship song off the cuff. If I were going to lead worship, I would need at least two weeks of practice just to get us through Kumbaya. So I don't labor there. That's not in my gifting. But there's an obvious weakness in this approach, right? Right? For years, I've heard our directional leader, Mickey, say the problem with gift-based ministry is no one's gift is taken out the trash. In other words, there's just some things that have to be done. We had a young guy serve with our team for a while, and he got a, a job, a full-time ministry job. He went, and moved away, took it, and he came back to visit, and he wanted to meet with me. And he said, man, this church I'm working at, they're asking me to do a lot of things I'm not passionate about. I said, like what? He said, well, like on Sundays, they want me to find the guys to take the offering. I said, man, my advice is get passionate about the offering. (laughs) That's something that's got to be done. So yes, we labor in our gifting, but Paul balances that in verse 15 by saying, be diligent. Work. Paul's saying, work hard. It has a sense of keep doing this. Every year, the elders send something to our staff telling us what they want us to try to lead the church toward in the coming year, the places they want us to emphasize. And every year, it has this phrase, keep doing and improving. That's what Paul's saying to Timothy. Yes, God's given you a gift. Don't neglect that gift. Labor in that gift. But at the same time, keep working. One writer said, there's no success in ministry apart from hard work. See, sometimes we think grace and hard work are opposites. No, that's a false dichotomy. Grace says our salvation's a gift. We can't work to earn it. We shouldn't work so that God won't be mad at us anymore. We shouldn't work so that God will love us. No, we work because God's not mad at us anymore. We work because God already loves us. And what happens when we're diligent? He says, everyone will see your progress. We'll get better. We've all seen this, right? As your community group goes and your leader leads a few discussions, they get better at it. When you share your faith, the more you do it, the more natural it becomes. You get better at it. The first time you try to read your Bible, you read three verses and you close it and you say, I don't know what that's even saying. But if you stick with it, Paul says, if you give yourself wholly to it, you get better at it and before long, You're a self-feeder. You can read it, understand it, and even teach it to somebody else. Paul says, go all in. Give yourself wholly to this, and everyone will see your progress. By God's grace, none of us should be the same today as we were five years ago. And my prayer is none of us will be the same five years from now because we'll all be growing, developing knowledge and skill, and most importantly, being more like Christ. And then Paul says in verse 16, the result is that our life and our teaching will match up. He says, if your life and your doctrine align, not only will you be able to stay on the right track, but you'll be able to help others do the same. When he says, you'll save yourself and your hearers, he's not talking about eternal salvation. Paul knows Timothy can't save anybody, neither can Paul, neither can we, that kind of salvation, eternal salvation, that's available through grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. 
What he means here is persevering in the faith. Or for our purposes this morning, staying spiritually healthy. He says when we put these things into practice, not only will we be, will we be healthy spiritually, but we'll be able to help others stay spiritually healthy as well. How do we do that? By watching our life and our doctrine. This in the Greek, it literally means watch yourself, pay attention to yourself and to your teaching. When our life and our teaching match up, man, that's a place where God can work. My friend Brad Reagan says, don't talk about it, be about it. My son Isaac, when he was playing basketball, he used to work out in a shirt that said, do you run more than your mouth? <laughs> that's what Paul's getting at. Does your life match up with what you teach? Remember verse 12? Your mouth, your conduct, your love, your faith, your purity. See how all of this ties together? That if we want to be servant ministers, diakonos, of Messiah Jesus, the King, we need to pursue spiritual health. We wanna let the Holy Spirit work in us so that ministry just flows out in the overflow of the spiritual health that we're experiencing. Now, before we leave this passage, I wanna make sure we've got a couple things straight. Number one, if you're here today and you're just kinda of checking out church, you wanna see what the, the deal is with Jesus, you're trying to put some things together, this message is not where you start because you start your journey to spiritual health by getting to know Jesus. Jesus is the great physician, and he actually said, I didn't come here for healthy people. I came here for the sick people, and all of us start out spiritually sick. But Jesus also said, I came that they might have life and have it to the full. So that's where health starts is in meeting Jesus. And so if you wanna know about how you can have an experience of spiritual health that begins with Jesus, talk to any one of us. I would love to talk to you. I'll be down here after the service. Ryan would love to talk to you. There's people in the prayer room, the community booth, they'd love to talk to you. Or maybe you came here today with someone who's a follower of Jesus, a friend of yours. I promise you, they would love nothing more than to talk to you about how you can begin your journey towards spiritual health by beginning a relationship with Jesus. That's who Paul calls the living God and the Savior of the world in this passage, and I want you to know, he is just that, and he's waiting to meet you and help you learn what it means to be healthy and truly live. And if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, this passage is a real heart check. How is my speech? How is my conduct? How's my love, my faith, my purity? How am I doing with my diet and exercise? Am I taking in God's word daily? Am I letting the Holy Spirit train me for godliness? But the last thing I want is for any believer to walk out of here today thinking, I gotta do better, I gotta work harder. Yeah, the passage uses language like labor and strive and be diligent, use our gifts, train ourselves. But we do all of that, all of that in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one who actually does the work. He's the one who'll give us the strength, the endurance, the gifting, our job individually and as a church, is to put ourselves in a position to be used. We do that by trusting in Jesus. We hear from him as we read our Bible. We, we see him as we gather and, and look into the faces of each other in groups large and small. And then we're ready. We're ready to speak truth graciously. We're ready to serve gladly. And we're ready to love generously, all in the name of Jesus. Because our ministry comes out of spiritual health as we follow Messiah Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, and our King. Hey, let's pray. Lord, thanks for the truths of your word. Thank you that just this morning, you've nourished us with the truth of the Bible. 
Lord, we know you're here and we know you're at work. And Lord, you're our living hope because as it says in this passage, you are the living God and we worship you.